Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us in the fifth session in the doula and perinatal community health worker in Medicaid learning series. My name is Jill Wadnick. I'm honored to be part of the project team here at IMI and EMC. I would like to begin by thanking our partner, Every Mother Counts, as well as our funder, Community Health Acceleration Partnership, and their commitment for advancing these important perinatal conversations. We are able to offer this free learning series because of their generous and ongoing support. This learning series includes eight monthly one-hour Zoom sessions. Topics will include relevant policy issues, pre-session materials, supplemental resources, and invited subject matter experts. As a refresher, we link the pre-session materials for today and have placed them in the chat. These sessions are recorded and will be archived on the IMI website. All attendees are automatically muted. To participate in the discussion with the speakers, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions and comments. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the session. Any unanswered questions will be consolidated and shared with our presenters and project team after today's session. We will send out the responses with the post-session material. At the completion of this session, you will receive an email with a link to complete a short three-minute survey. As a reminder, a completion of the survey is required as part of this participation in the learning series. We actively review and incorporate your feedback into future sessions. We really look forward to hearing your thoughts. And finally, all materials, including the slides, and session recording will be available to you on the IMI website about two weeks after the session. Today's learning objectives are to understand the challenges and opportunities in ensuring data collection, monitoring, and evaluation of community-based doula and perinatal community health worker programs in Medicaid. Second, to identify ways to communicate the value and impact of Medicaid coverage for community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers. And finally, to become familiar with state examples of impact measures for Medicaid programs for community doulas and perinatal community health workers. Before we hear from our speakers for this session, we feel it's important to continue to reiterate that we must avoid placing the burden of addressing all maternal health inequities solely on the shoulders of doulas and perinatal community health workers. As previously stated, access and coverage to doula and perinatal community health worker services in Medicaid is just one element of a multi-prong approach that's needed to support system-wide transformation. For this session, we are excited. Yanti will be our moderator and I'll hand it off to her now. Hi everyone, I'm so excited and honored to moderate this session with this wonderful group of panelists today. Um, so we have Ali Quintos from Sister Web. We have Dr. Cassandra Marshall from UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And then we have Dr. Ellen Tilden from the Oregon Health and Science University. We have placed their speaker bios in the chat. 
Um, during today's session, our three speakers will share their experiences capturing value and demonstrating impact to Medicaid stakeholders through the use of research and data. Once they have completed their presentations, we'll transition into a moderated panel discussion and finally to audience questions. Um, first, we'll be hearing from Dr. Ellen Tilden. I'll pass it off to her. Thank you, Yanti. I'm so delighted to be here today and speak about this important topic. Next slide, please. In 2011, I had the pleasure to serve on the Oregon House Bill Committee to help advise state leaders on opportunities to add doula care for um, Medicaid reimbursement. And through that work, it became clear that at that time, there was really insufficient literature to help define the cost benefit and cost effectiveness of doula care for Medicaid supported people. And that inspired my academic team to create this cost effective effectiveness analysis published in 2019 that I'm gonna briefly describe to you. Something new about this modeling approach that we, um, is that we structured it to better reflect average population events. So most US women who birth uh, have um, two children, but prior childbearing cost effectiveness analyses only model cost and outcomes over one pregnancy and birth. So by choosing to model cost and outcomes of doula care over two births, it helped us better estimate both the lifetime impact for the average US birthing individual, as well as a population level impact. Next slide, please. So cost effectiveness analyses are an approach to estimating the societal impact of a healthcare decision or an event. And this is generally most useful when the subject at hand does not lend itself to a controlled trial. With this kind of modeling, we use the strongest previously published research to inform the risks of different decisions. And here, obviously, doula care versus no doula care during a person's first labor and birth. And several steps are required to then estimate the cost consequences of each clinical decision point. Finally, we apply quality adjusted life years, which is a way of estimating the strength of a person's preference for each outcome. And because all of these estimates about outcomes, costs, and quality adjusted life years include some uncertainty, we also conducted a series of sensitivity analyses that challenge our initial findings and demonstrate how estimates would change if our input variables change. Next slide, please. So this image shows a small part of the decision tree we used in the model. And as I will soon describe in more detail, because the strongest science on the impact of doula care is currently about decreasing cesarean birth, this was the outcome we focused on for the model. Um, so go ahead and uh, change the slide, please, again. Because that even that small section of the decision tree is a little difficult to see and interpret, I decided to share a much closer view of an even smaller subsection. So looking on the far left of the slide, you can see that the population included were all US people during their first birth. Um, we compared here, you see the part of the tree that's examining and modeling the outcomes of those who had doula support during that first birth. We have a parallel tree that branches out um, for those who did not have doula care during that first birth. And if you follow the decision tree to the right, you can see that we then estimated the impact of the first birth with or without doula care on events um, for immediately cesarean or vaginal birth, but then also on subsequent events with the next pregnancy, including outcomes related to vaginal birth after cesarean or trial of labor after cesarean or planned repeat cesarean section. Next slide. This table uh, shares the probabilities of the outcomes that were relevant um, regarding doula care presence or not for that first birth, as well as utilities of some of the key outcomes. And for each of these probability estimates, you can see that we cite the source we relied on to derive those estimates. These are further subdivided by outcomes relevant to the first childbearing episode. You can see at the top their current pregnancy and then subsequent childbearing episodes. Next slide, please. Our key findings indicate that if there was a doula present with every person during their first labor and birth, this would decrease maternal death, 
while annually saving $247 million and adding over 10,000 quality adjusted life years. We also, another key finding was that doula care payment between 11,000 and 1,800, I'm sorry, 1,100 and 1,800 um, dollars per um, childbearing episode was cost effective. And I'd like to further detail what I mean by that bolded statement at the end. And the next few slides share more about the limitations of our model and why these outcomes and cost effectiveness estimates are very conservative and likely an underestimate of the true value of doula care. Next slide, please. We have about 40 years of doula research and here's what we know and kind of in summary about the positive outcomes associated with this model of care. Um, and a quick aside, unlike many things we look at in biomedical research, we have no evidence that doula care increases risk for either the birthing person or their child. So like how most science tends to unfold, there's more cumulative and compelling evidence for some of these associations, while other outcomes have been found um, with more recent evidence, and there's need for replication studies to help understand if that association with doula care is consistently found in different populations. Next slide, please. So of this evidence, our model only considered cesarean. Um, we, and we made that decision for many reasons, but the, the, the main one is that the, the science is, is strong enough and cumulative enough on that particular point that it, we felt it was appropriate to include in the cost effectiveness model. Next slide, please. So even though we have fairly compelling evidence that doula care improves many of these outcomes, particularly length of labor, breastfeeding success, satisfaction with care, a few that come to mind is really um, pretty compelling, the impact of all of these outcomes were left out of the model. And for this reason, our findings are likely a sizable underestimate of the true positive cost effectiveness of doula care. Next slide. And I'd just like to end with this question for now. Given this overarching, really strong body of science recommending doula care as an immediately implementable, effective approach to protecting and sustaining people during childbearing, I think what are, we need to think about what are we going to do to both create the systems needed to increase access to doula care and also sustain and prevent burnout of the doula care workforce. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tilden. I was like taking notes during that. That was so wonderful. Um, so we look forward to hearing more about your the impact of your research during the Q&A. Um, next, we'll hear from Dr. Cassandra Marshall. Thank you so much, Yanti. And yes, Dr. Tilden, that was um, a wonderful presentation. And um, you hit so many important points that um, I will expand upon, but also give it a bit of a different flavor too. Um, so next slide here. So um, just to give some background and orient you to uh, where all of the, the subsequent comments will be coming from, um, I, you know, created a few, uh, I think, key takeaway messages that reflect my work in a few different projects, which I'll just briefly describe here. Um, so I've worked on um, a partnered evaluation of the Sister Web San Francisco Community Doula Network and their programs um, that support Black, Pacific Islander, and Latinx pregnant people in San Francisco. You'll be hearing from the illustrious and wonderful Wonderful. Ali Quintos in a, uh, a moment, um, who is from that organization. Um, but we partnered with them on a process and outcome evaluation um, of their programs, particularly for Black and Pacific Islander people, um, and using an equitable evaluation framework. So some of my comments will be coming from this in this role as a researcher partnering with a community organization for evaluation. The second thing I'll be drawing from is a project that I worked on and I should say that project was led by the fantastic Anu Manchakanti Gomez at UC Berkeley, one of my colleagues. Um, the second project I'll be drawing from is a project where we interviewed Medi-Cal managed care plans and other stakeholders about preparing to implement the Medi-Cal doula benefit, which went live here in California in January of 2023. Um, and we also interviewed commercial plans and large employers about future investments in doula care. And so this was really to gain a better understanding of the barriers and facilitators to payer investment in community doula care specifically. Doula care more broadly, but we specifically probed around community-based models. 
Um, and so I'll be drawing from that. And thirdly, I'll be drawing from a kind of unique project that wasn't a research project, but was really a capacity building project where we brought together key stakeholders, including doulas, uh, community doulas, uh, clients, uh, so, you know, people who had used doulas during their birthing experiences, public health professionals, clinicians, advocates, policymakers, and researchers. And so we brought together this, this collaborative, essentially, from different backgrounds and overlapping identities, I should say. Many, many people had, you know, identified with more of one of these roles to talk about how we should be conducting research in this space, what are some of the best practices, and also to develop a shared research agenda. So what's next? What needs to be studied? Um, you know, that we believe so much in partnership, which is why we brought all of these key, key stakeholders, excuse me, key stakeholders together. If we'd only brought, in, brought one or two of these groups, we wouldn't have a shared um, research agenda because we think that is actually what's going to happen if we can bring the right people to the table. Next slide. So thank you. So again, these comments kind of reflect my, my involvement in all three of those projects. So the first thing I'll say is um, when thinking about measuring impact is to consider the breadth of doula work when measuring impact and which data collection methods are fitting. So with respect to measuring impact, we often see a focus um, on clinical outcomes. Um, some of which was, you know, mentioned in the last presentation, um, which is very appropriate, right? A lot of the literature and the evidence uh, there really does support a lot of these clinical outcomes like, you know, C-section and preterm birth and breastfeeding, things of that nature. But I'm going to encourage us to take a broader view as well. And my slides, my following slides will kind of um, explain why. The other thing I want to mention is that we need to think about maybe what's being prevented by having a doula present, right? So it's not an outcome that we're going to see because it was prevented. So how do we wrestle with that? I don't fully have that answer, but I think it's something to keep in mind um, when we are trying to really understand the true value and impact, what perhaps negative outcome did not happen because doulas were present. Um, one, some things that our research has revealed beyond clinical kind of outcomes or that doulas mitigate racism. Uh, some of our most recent research that was just published um, from our team has shown that they can foster accountability in clinical care environments in hospital settings. Um, another role that I'll elaborate on in a moment is that they connect clients to resources. Um, and one thing that we've heard across all of these projects is that some things just can't be captured quantitatively. And I don't mean to say that we shouldn't have our metrics and our indicators and our percentage points and our rates on all of these various indicators, but there is a role for qualitative work. There is a role for storytelling. Um, and so one of the things that came out of this, this stakeholder engagement, this capacity building project I mentioned a moment ago, is that stakeholders actually expressed a preference for qualitative data collection methods um, because they can create opportunities for storytelling and um, community healing even. And, um, and this is, again, not to take away from what uh, quantitative indicators we need to have, but really just trying to broaden our thoughts around the idea of having stories. Um, at the same time, stakeholders also noted that asking doulas to provide documentation to collect data for research purposes can be overly burdensome, especially when funders, um, including health plans and researchers, do not seek their input um, from the start. And so um, I think my point here is to think both about the breadth, which I'll elaborate in a moment, but what kinds of data are we trying to generate given uh, what we know about what doulas do? Next slide. And, and that's what this speaks exactly to. Um, in one of our projects, this capacity building project, it became so apparent at different points in the project that there was a need for just general awareness and education on what community doulas are doing and the roles that they're serving in their communities and, and how it, they are supporting um, pregnant people. And uh, so we thought we already had these wonderful stakeholders at the table we can help contribute to that, right? And uh, not necessarily, you know, provide this perfect definition, but give a flavor and an essence of all the roles that they are playing and the true value of what they are doing. 
And so this image on the right is, is, is a beautiful illustration that came out of this work just to really uplift the role that they're playing in their communities. So doulas and Ali can speak to this and others probably, you know, better than I can. I'm not a doula, but they wear many hats. They build kinship with their clients. They listen to their clients' concerns and they can actually facilitate and do facilitate communication with their providers. They help clients understand the information they receive from clinicians. They spend the time necessary discussing to be honest, what should have happened in their clinical um, appointments, right? You know, really providing that outside wraparound support. They are connecting their clients to resources, um, including food, housing, transportation, health care, which includes mental health care, and, and more. And so, again, um, on the right here, it's just outlining all of these roles that they play um, in the community. And so, for me as a researcher, when I am thinking about maybe measuring impact or evaluating or whatever it is, I have to take into account this breath, right? Which, um, to be honest, hasn't been fully captured in available evidence and literature. Uh, next slide. And my final point. Um, and this is about gaining buy-in and kind of communicating impact. So in the project where we talked to Medi-Cal managed care plans, um, uh, you know, before implementing uh, this Medi-Cal benefit that just went live this year, three of these plans had already been doing pilot work. So they had already invested through pilot programs in doulas to serve their membership. And one of the things that we heard from these pilots is the importance of evaluating these programs and collecting member success stories. So these stakeholders communicated to us that it was imperative and critical that they have these stories of success because that helped to gain leadership buy-in. So when they went to their bosses and, and plan leadership, they could say, look what this the impact this pilot is having. Um, there were some challenges. So number one, which shouldn't be surprising given some of my previous comments that they had to ask doulas to engage in doula data collection, um, which again may... Um, if not really designed appropriately at the beginning, may not have been feasible or fully compensated. Um, and there were small, small sample sizes. So these were pilots and you were not always able to see, you know, the strongest, most significant results. So there were some challenges, but having that data was critical for getting buy-in. And the other thing that they communicated was that they had to continually seek and listen to doula feedback. Um, throughout the process of these pilot programs. And they ultimately helped the pilots and they helped gain doula buy-in. So doulas understood why they were collecting data and what the role of having these success stories, you know, and, and sharing that back with plan leadership. So just briefly, I'll wrap up in a moment. I'll say, this is a quote from one of the uh, participants in our study, one of the medical managed care plan um, stakeholders said, we've had really great outcomes and we've had data points that we can speak to. We're really excited about the benefit going live. This is the medical benefit. We're looking forward to the fact that all of our members will be able to leverage the services and also the fact that we have connections with the community and the county as well. I think that will help position ourselves for the benefit as well because they know we've been doing this and that they can trust us with this whole process. So again, these pilot programs were just you know, primed because they had already spent the time uh, engaging, connecting, um, aligning with doulas, and they had the data, they had the stories that could they could leverage in making this benefit work even better or, or work well from the beginning, actually. And with that, um, I'll say thank you. I have just one final slide to acknowledge the funders of my work and, you know, links for more information, which I can share later. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. Um, this was such a nice continuation of the, the I Watched Your Hersa and Rich webinar, and it's also a nice lead-in because Allie was also in that webinar, and we're going to move on to Allie Puentos. Greetings, everybody. My name is Allie Puentos. I'm one of the co-founders of SisterWeb and currently serve as the Director of Evaluations, uh, otherwise known by my coworkers as the Data Queen, and I'm super grateful to be here today. Uh, next slide. So um, I'm starting off, you're going to see a lot of these funny memes in my in my presentation because it is one of the ways that we use a more accessible, some people call it popular education style methods to excite our data, our doulas about data collection. Um, because most people, including myself a few years ago, were not very excited about the word data. 
Uh, since the beginning of Sister Web, we were asked by a lot of funders and city officials to justify why our ideal doula model had a relatively low caseload for doulas, but still we sought um, in a perfect world, all of our doulas be full-time salaried and benefited with job security. So we were working on the external evaluation with UC Berkeley that Cassie talked about, and uh, we heard about this idea about a time use to really look at the, the key question, what does it take to run a community doula program? Next slide. We called our research study Fun February, again, motivation. And um, we were looking to, to answer that question, what does it take, really from a workforce viewpoint. The methods were very low tech, um, sending out email and text reminders. We set up a form of data collection through Google Sheets, where doulas were asked to track their daily work in a log. And, um, you know, every week I would send out funny uh, data related memes, and we had small incentives. It was really different than the larger scale evaluation that we were running with UC Berkeley because this was our project designed and led by us and for our own use. I do want to acknowledge all the researchers from UC Berkeley were very supportive and most specifically Janet Arcara, um, one of our researchers really took the lead on giving us some of the technical skills that we, we were still building. Next slide. So the money that it took to run the study was very low in case there's other community doula orgs on the call that are like, how can we do this? Um, we bought donuts, pan dulce, some cute birthy related mugs. We did raffle a $50 gift card that was donated, and it did require a lot of staff time and buy-in. Um, here you can see in the photo, this is a picture of my dad uh, who lives downstairs from me with two out of my four kids. Uh, my dad was was key in driving around the boxes of donuts and pan dulce to all of the doulas that got their time logs in by the end of each week. At that time, there were eight um, staff doulas in Sister Web during February of 2021. Next slide. Here's the full list of all the work categories on this slide, and you'll see some more on the next slide, that uh, doulas reported during the month of February 2021. We didn't give the doulas predetermined categories to allocate hours because we really wanted to see all the things that might come up in a month and starting off from a blank slate. Next slide. Some of the categories that you'll see were are really specific to doulas working in a community-based organization, not um, as independent or private doulas. And I know in the required reading for this section was um, our, our time use study in the published form, and that has all the charts and all the data, so you can look at it more in depth. Next slide. To pull out a couple um, key points, about half of doula's work um, recorded each week was spent in direct client care and support. Uh, given that the common caseload for doula, for our doulas at Sister Web is one to two expected births per month, Doula spent a lot of their time doing other client-focused work outside of labor and delivery support. A lot of the doula time is spent uh, during prenatal visits, postpartum visits, and outside of regular visits, doing client-focused research, prep work, care coordination with other members of the care team, and even, especially during COVID, distributing supplies to clients. We did look at client notes from the appointments in February because we could see exactly how much time was spent on each individual visit. Those findings are also included in the journal article. There were 38 other client interactions in the month outside of scheduled visits, and that's an average of three and a half interactions per client. They range in um, you know, a 10 minute interaction of some quick texting between a doula and a client to several hours of a doula showing up cooking food, watching a new baby while the new mom napped. So that point that Cassie made about doulas wearing a lot of hats uh, could not be more true. Next slide. So here I have a couple slides on our key findings. Given the unpredictable nature of doula work, no two weeks or two months are going to be the same, but we were able to glean some trends um, that hopefully are helpful for other growing community doula organizations. Next slide. 
on average, for every hour spent in prenatal or postpartum appointments with clients, doulas also spent an additional hour working with their cohort, which is what in Sister Web we call um, doula partners that are working together to support a family and their supervisor to coordinate care. Spending about an additional 47 minutes on client follow-ups and reminders to ensure consistent care. This goes back to that question, what does it really take to achieve those clinical outcomes that everyone loves talking about? It's a lot of calling and texting. Um, and, and then again, 22 minutes doing research, gathering resources, distributing supplies to clients, and coordinating care with other providers. Next slide. So um, the, the last point of the findings is really keeping up with documentation, emails, and general admin tasks does take time for doulas each week. Um, given how much time is reflected in the Fun February data, our client records are really extensive. They're mostly complete and very accurate. So again, this is that moment to slow down and look at to achieve high quality. Oftentimes, um, you do have to slow down and, and compensate for all that hard work. Next slide. I'd like to zoom back out and just talk about things that Sister Web learned related to our data practices. We felt like we really needed to come up with um, some guiding principles to drive our work forward outside of working with the UC Berkeley research team and Fun February. All of our data practices we felt like needed to fall with within these six values. Collaboration and co-creation, we do engage our frontline staff, our doulas, in the creation of our data collection forms, not just a one-time thing. We redo our forms in an edit audit process every single year to keep them fresh. We compensate our doulas for all their time spent documenting. The clarity of purpose, it's that transparency of letting the doulas know why are they collecting this data, um, why note-taking is important, what it will be used for, getting consent from both staff and clients, carefully protecting data through HIPAA-compliant programs and software, and then using the data not just to highlight the inequities that sadly are still there, but also to celebrate the strengths of community-based approaches. Next slide. We use this framework called results-based accountability and pretty much everything that Cassie already said, we, um, our compass to make sure we're doing it right is that our evaluations methods need to be purposeful, powerful, and practical, really keeping that practical um, at the forefront for our doulas to feel like it's not too burdensome. Next slide. So this is my personal favorite out of all the memes. Um, you know, a, a lot of people are like, oh, this data, this documentation, is it all just to justify our program because of funding? And even though that is a big part of it, we also found that the designing and running our own data collection practices meant that we had the creativity and flexibility to um, do a deeper dive into our data, uh, use it for programmatic improvements, and we, we've been able just in the last two years to put out some really innovative reports documenting the impact of COVID on our staff, uh, looking at return rate data on our client satisfaction surveys and how to get the most uh, powerful and robust data possible. And even doing a deeper dive report into our intake sessions with our clients and what are those um, really key lessons that we need to learn about our client needs that will help shape our program in the future. Next slide. We see here, this is one of the points that we made in the Fun February data, but um, here you can see a snapshot of what I see when I log into our software, and we can actually look at the data from multiple viewpoints. So here we took those non-appointment client interactions texting, calling, dropping off diapers, and we tracked them over a seven-month period, we saw that over the course of seven months, we were able to really analyze that our doulas were spending on average of one hour per day, Monday through Friday, on non-appointment client interactions. That is huge. We did not know that before we tracked this data. 
And we really needed to make sure that those essential interactions that build rapport with our clients, that ensure they have everything they need to be successful uh, are compensated. Next slide. So when Cassie talked about some of the unquantifiable aspects of doula care, um, before I was director of evaluations, when I was program director, I was also serving as one of the doula mentors. And I had a week in November where I noticed I was getting so many calls and texts from my mentees, doulas and sister web, that were naming some of those challenges of community doula work, exhaustion, burnout, um, having trouble with sustained childcare over multiple days. So at, in my role, I was able to sit down at our system, pull a bunch of data out, run this quick analysis, and I realized, oh my gosh, look at these 10 days of work that our doulas just did. That many hours at births. That means also that doulas are trading off 10 hours on, 10 hours to sleep, 10 hours on. Um, it's a huge impact, and we really need to acknowledge those unquantifiable aspects of doula care when thinking about reimbursement rates. It also helped us create a policy at SisterWeb where doulas can take protected rest time after they get home from a birth. Next slide. Um, here I, I have a, a quote from one of our clients about the amazing work that, that one of our doulas, Azra Muhammad, did. And if you skip to the next slide, you're going to see uh, at the bottom, that's Azra, and next to her, her client, Shanae. This aspect of workforce development also really needs to be named as something that should be counted in doula program time and compensation. Shanae, this client, went on to take a sister web doula training, uh, complete our doula apprenticeship program, and is now seeking employment with sister web. Next slide. And here... Um, just a quick snapshot of some of our uh, current data. This one point, and, and maybe I'm going to need to end here, is 85% of clients would someday like to help members of their community by becoming community doulas. I just think that's amazing. This type of client reported data is really remarkable. It's like 85% um, of people walking out of a bakery saying, I want to be a baker. And uh, that would be some really good bread. So I want to end my presentation by acknowledging all of the Sister Web doulas and actually all the community doulas listening to this presentation. I see you. I feel your work. And it's an honor uh, to stand with you as a doula. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, what struck me just during that listening to your presentation was the fact that you could use the data, like we're talking about the value and impact, but you use the data in so many different ways. Um, I think that was that was really powerful to hear. Um, I also just wanna continue to stress, like we stressed earlier, Jill stressed earlier with you all that um, we just have to make sure that that we're keeping in mind that um, we are, that doulas are not gonna be the end all be all and that we want to make sure that we're, we're this is one element of a total system transformation needed to provide high quality equitable maternal care. Um, so we are, I'm really excited to moderate today's panel discussion with all three of these amazing champions of the work. Um, I am a member of the project team and I'm in charge of analyzing all of the evaluation data from the surveys um, that everyone completes after each session. And I've had a firsthand look at what topics everyone is eager to learn about. Um, and so as a result of that, we've developed some great questions that we hope reflect um, what participants are, are eager to hear. Um, and we're gonna ask them and we're gonna also continue, please continue to um, add your questions to the Q&A chat. So let's get right to it. Our first question is, um, what are your top pieces of advice for states and health plans on how to support doulas and data collection? Um, could you please try to keep your responses down to two minutes? Um, but we are gonna start with Cassie. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, this this builds off of um, my, my earlier presentation and many of the points um, that have been made. Um, so a, a few things that I think are important in, in, the, in this space um, is communication from the beginning, right? So when developing whatever measures or metrics, um, when developing the plan uh, to collect data, there needs to be ongoing communication, um, collaboration with doulas. Um, 
ongoing feedback, right? So from the start is good, but but throughout the process of it, because you may need to pivot and make changes. That was um, my, my third point, which is be willing to pivot. The plan that you created um, for showing impact or demonstrating impact for collecting data may not work. You may find that you designed, again, speaking as a researcher here, you designed this wonderful, you know, evaluation plan or data collection plan. And again, this is coming from my, our work, you know, in working with a community-based organization. It, it, it may not work. There were many times we were on calls with Sister Web and it was like, yeah, what we thought was going to be the plan isn't going to be the plan and we need to change that. Um, connected to that, figuring out what's realistic feasible, which is easy for the, you know, the, the frontline people who are actually having to document, that needs to be paramount, right? If you want that data, if you want to be able to show impact, we need to think about how the data is being collected, who's shouldering that burden, and are they able to do that in a realistic, feasible, and easy way? And then finally, I'm going to bring it to the money, which, you know, shouldn't be surprising as of, you know, some of the things that have come up so far, this takes time, this takes energy. And so data collection efforts need to be compensated appropriately. Thank you, Cassie. Um, next, Ellen. I'm sorry, no, next, Allie. We'll end with Ellen. Sorry. That's okay. Um, yes, ditto to all of that. Uh, getting doulas at the table from the very beginning to co-create some of those uh, data collection methods. I think also maybe possibly at the same time or before that, doing a deep dive into what's already happening in the community, right? Putting on your like scientist observation gardener lens, sitting and watching what is already happening. What are doula organizations and doulas already collecting and how to build from there? Um, and then, you know, funding of doula organizations like Sister Web, but there's so many organizations doing great work across the country that are serving as that professional home for doulas. Uh, we're able to provide the software for people to use to track their work, um, ongoing mentorship, training, uh, core competencies in things like note taking and, and documentation. Those are um, those hard skills, the professional hard skills um, it's not a one and done. Organizations need to have funding and budget to retrain and retrain as, as they go. Okay, and then we're going to finish off with Dr. Tilden, who has some slides to show for us as well while she answers this question. Thank you, Auntie. I'm happy to build on all of the, agree with all of the points that my colleagues have shared. Um, I don't collect, um, you know, primary doula data. And so my thinking is a little bit more um, systems level in terms of state level opportunities or large health system opportunities. And I'd love to comment on a couple of pearls um, that I've learned from my work um, on, on with that kind of data collection and analysis. So um, can you please go to the next slide? The first thought I have is, uh, is to, in my experience, there's sometimes a disconnect between those designing the study, those thinking about things like we, you know, for example, changing the birth certificate, um, which we did in Oregon um, uh, several years ago to better capture data on perinatal processes, disconnect between those who, who create that and those who actually implement it. And I offer as a cautionary tale, these two publications, um, if you are interested in taking a look, um, briefly, they they both demonstrated that two states were um, had greatly underestimated um, and were inaccurate in reflecting who had actually attended the birth um, uh, and was listed on the birth certificate as the attendant. Um, this work in Kentucky underestimated by 20 percent and then Texas underestimated by 65 percent. Now, there are many factors about why, and, and I don't mean to make broad generalizations, but I would say one, one piece of information that came out some of this work that I found really interesting, I think could apply to state level efforts or health, large health system efforts to capture whether or not a doula was present at the birth and thus then be able to um, set up data to, to track some of those outcomes, doula related outcomes, um, is making sure that the person whose responsibility it is to, to collect that data actually um, is aware that the doula um, was part of the care. And really the only people um, in, in a labor and delivery floor where I work 
who would know that are going to be the patient, obviously, um, but then the nurse and the attending provider are going to be the ones who would know whether or not a doula was present. So how do um, there has to be careful thought about how to capture that knowledge, um, because the folks who are at the front desk or who have other administrative tasks um, likely would not know. The next point is I really encourage all of us to be inspired and look to models that function well and already demonstrate impact. And I'm gonna call out the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. Um, if you have not already explored the work that they're doing and some of the options to participate in that or to see how they have done data collection, I encourage you to explore that. Next slide, please. Two final thoughts. Um, we all know race is a really familiar, but a truly weak proxy variable for tracking the impact of racism on health. And there are many health equity scholars who are leading with work to help us better target and measure variables that promise you much more relevant and meaningful to understanding the causes of race associated outcomes and start identifying meaningful targets to address health disparities. I offer a couple publications here to consider but there's a really sizable and, and growing body of work from scholars all over the country thinking carefully about these opportunities. And then finally, think Sweden. Uh, having just finished some work with Swedish data, um, being able to link, um, to link data is really key. And one thing that comes to mind on that is um, that I think is a reflection and purely relevant to the this final suggestion. So Dr. Um, Allison Stu from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, shared a metaphor on Twitter. She tweeted, in our current system of care, the baby is the candy and the mother is the candy wrapper. And our system of care and data collection is structured to really reflect this value. Once that baby or the prize is delivered, we're kind of done with the mom. So making sure that we, you know, and we know that so many near misses and maternal morbidity and mortality occurs in the postpartum period and sometimes well into the postpartum period. So both, if we're really interested in improving outcomes for this population, so we have to both be making sure that care is offered in that time period and then being able to track care in a way that links from the birth where we can see was the doula present or not and links into that postpartum period for the mom and the baby. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, those slides were helpful. That conversation was just so wonderful. We're going to get into question number two um, for Cassie. What are the implications beyond the re your research on the cost effectiveness of doula services for individuals enrolled in Medicaid that speak to the long term impact of doulas on maternal health? Um, I, I believe. Um... That question was for Dr. Tilden. No, you are so right. That is for Dr. Tilden. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at you, Tilden, but my... Dr. Tilden can speak better to me. Dr. Than Tilden, it. keep it rolling. You were just doing so great. Okay, back to me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, I think a couple of things come to mind, and actually, some of what you shared, Dr. Marshall, really got me thinking about this as well. Um, I think that we we know that we are we're really at the beginning of better characterizing and understanding both from qualitative methods that have already been discussed and the really key need for that, as well as I would argue for much more kind of quantitative and systematic efforts. I would like to see a change in birth certificates, frankly. Um, um, so uh, I think we have a long way to go in terms of really demonstrating the true impact of doula care um, and and moving forward in the long term impact, I guess one other thought is um, it's a difficult time to capture data, especially thinking about that longer term postpartum impact and beyond. People are having done data collection with folks when they are in the early postpartum. It's understandable. A lot of our patients are overwhelmed and exhausted with caring for a newborn um, and are not so um, amenable or available to the answering survey. So we have to be really creative and also really incentivize that kind of ongoing longitudinal data collection through the postpartum period and be also very thoughtful and respectful about people's boundaries and needs. The other thought, and this is what really tied, um, jumped to my mind when Dr. Marshall was sharing about um, some of the, you know, how we we don't know yet, but we have a lot of ideas around, uh, you know, why doulas may be a really key part of um, improving 
uh, decreasing, uh, you know, um, health inequity. Um, something that comes to mind is actually uh, Dr. Uh, Elliot Main, who, who started the um, California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative that I mentioned. Uh, he sh has shared about um, looking at maternal morbidity and mortality reviews around the country and the theme of um, that maternal, you know, severe illness or death is a combination of either denial, delay, or dismissal. And I'm very curious about how doula care addresses that dismissal piece um, and how racism it contributes to this ability to dismiss or this system in which people's, what they're sharing is dismissed. Um, so your comment, Dr. Marshall, about increasing accountability, how doulas can increase accountability. Um, I, I'm really interested to see what we can learn as we better, you know, look into uh, the actual role and the actual impact that doulas play in that immediate birth, in the safety of that family in the immediate, and then what that means long, long term for people. Thank you, Ellen. That was really interesting. I like how everything ties together. Um, moving to our next question is for Allie. Um, from your experience with the time you study, what lessons have you learned that you want to share about retention, program design, and benefit design? Um, thank you. I feel really passionate about this question. Um, because when we set out to start Sister Web, this was at the core of, of why we even um, launched the organization. Really thinking about the doula workforce, our doulas come from the same communities as our client base and how to take care of the emotional, physical, um, logistical, and I would say even spiritual needs of sustaining doula work ongoing. This is um, that ongoing workforce development that I've already talked about is essential to retaining staff. Also for community dual organizations to have leadership that reflects the staff, I think is also key. And um, really addressing some of those barriers, like the, I, I love what, what someone said about, you know, what's being prevented. I think the same could be true about workforce. Things like affordable childcare, things like, um, you know, so social networking and support structures for doulas to be able to offload after a really difficult birth. And then I think that piece around addressing systemic change and racism, Sister Web runs a parallel program called the Champion Dyad Initiative, where we engage in that honest, hard, uh, bi-directional feedback with all the L&D hospital sites in the city. And our doulas need us to keep doing that right, for their own safety, for their client's safety. So really fighting for a seat at the table to provide um, some truth telling at a systems level. Thanks, Ali. I was also struck by that, what is being prevented uh, comment that Dr. Marshall mentioned in her presentation. Um, and moving on to you, Dr. Marshall, finally the right time. <laughs> um, how do you authentically engage community stakeholders and doulas in research and policy making? It's a great question. Um, I certainly don't feel like I'm an expert at that, right? But I think that we are attempting to do that. Um, and so some, some lessons from our projects, um, I'll, I'll speak to that. I mean, the first one I will say is listen. Listen, I mean, again, I'm coming at this as someone who is not a doula, as someone who's a trained researcher in an academic institution that, um, like most academic institutions, have perpetuated harm in their local communities. Um, so we need to be aware of that. And so I think authentic engagement comes from listening, from understanding. In this case, if we're studying doula care, our quote unquote intervention are doulas, right? And these are people. Um, and, 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 and the work that they do is sacred, right? It's not you know, it's, 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 it's different to me than some of the other things that we study, um, in, at least in the field of public health. And so I think showing up and listening is important. Money, compensation, payment. I mean, I don't, we could all talk, we, yeah, that's its own webinar, but, or, you know, learning session, but true, truly thinking about um, if you are bring, if you are going to ask time, ask for time, if you're going to ask for action in terms of data collection, if you're just there to, you know, generate ideas, that all needs to be compensated, right? Um, 
creating the space is important, right? So this isn't just shooting off an email when, hey, you know, we're thinking about doing this, this benefit or whatever. Um, can you, you know, can you spare 15 minutes to, you know, give me, give me your perspective? It's no, how, what is the space? What is the container so that uh, true communication can happen so that um, the right people are at the table um, so that it's enjoyable and you want people want to show up to your meetings, like, you know, creating the container related to that is acknowledge the power dynamics, right? When you bring I, something I'm working on in one of my other projects, you think, oh, we're going to bring all the stakeholders. Everyone's going to be at the table and share their opinion. Well, no, there's power dynamics involved when everyone is at the table. Some people don't feel comfortable speaking up. Some people dominate the conversation. Um, so, how, you know, some people have not been invited before to really provide their perspective on research and evaluation and data. So how are you making them comfortable? Um, and how are you centering the doulas voice um, and clients' voices as well. And the final thing I'll say, know what research, and I guess I would say, you know, slash data slash evaluation can do, what it can't do, what the right role for it is, when it's not the time for research to speak up, um, what it should do and what it shouldn't do. And I guess I think about this as a researcher, like I play a certain role in this larger, you know, system of doula care and evidence and policy, but I'm like, a, I, I play a very, I'm still figuring out my role fully as someone who's not a doula. And so the question in my mind is, what can I contribute? How can I be in service of this evidence-based intervention that has been happening forever and will continue to happen? Um, and so, yeah, those are some of, I guess, my reflections from engagement in this space. Thank you so Sorry, much. That was too long. <laughs> no, perfect. Wonderful. Loved it. Um, we're going to end on this last question in the, in the interest of time, but it's a question that I feel is super important. And I'll give some background first before I hit the question, but it's about reflective supervision. And reflective supervision with doulas and perinatal community health workers can be described as the regular collaborative reflection between a doula or a perinatal community health worker and program administrator, mentor, or supervisor that builds on the doula's use of their thoughts, feelings, experiences, and values within an encounter with birthing individuals and families. Ali, how is this integrated into the sister web model and how is it considered in the time you study? I'll give you a minute and a half for this one. Thank you so much. Um, as a doula, I give thanks to my mentors, all the ones that I've had since I was a baby doula um, until now, 10 years later. Um, for community doulas, so a lot of our doulas, it could be um, whether it's a stepping stone like first entry into the workforce, a pivot in careers, many of our doulas have young children. So that reflective supervision in sister web with a supervisor who gets you, looks like you, comes from the community, um, is a place to receive some of the professional development skills, how to do time management, prioritization, um, how to troubleshoot some of the logistical challenges that can really get in the way of you showing up and doing your best work. That is something that is accounted for in the time you study and in our model for every doula. In addition to that, we also offer birth specific mentorship. Um, our mentors are both black midwives. They know the community deeply. They understand birth deeply. And I want y'all to like really hear this. They are on call 24 seven. When you are at a doula and the bleep hits the fan at a birth at three in the morning, you are not alone. And I cannot stress enough how much that matters to our doulas in terms of feeling supported professionally, emotionally. We are not sending them out there into the great sea of the unknown of birth to navigate those waters alone. So that work needs to be acknowledged and compensated. Thank you so much, Ali. And that was a wonderful way to end our, end our Q&A. Um, I wanna thank everyone, Dr. Tilden, um, Dr. Marshall and Ali for these amazing presentations and discussions during the Q&A. We appreciate all of your insight and expertise. And I'm gonna hand it off to Jill to wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you all so much. What a meaningful conversation. Uh, I wish we could keep it going. We really ask for you to complete the three minute survey. Uh, we will be sending it to you as part of the post session materials and you should be finding it right now, both in the chat. 
And at this time, you also should have received an email because I don't know about you, but there's a lot to really reflect and listen to and digest about today's session. And we want your feedback. We incorporate it and we're really eager to receive it. The, the All the materials from today's presentation will be made available to you and will be on the IMI website within two weeks. And we can't wait until you come back. Session six of doulas and perinatal community health workers, Medicaid learning series. The topic is ensuring community engagement, equity, and accountability in Medicaid. It will be on Thursday, May 4th, 2023 at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Keep an eye out for the pre-session materials with the agenda and the pre-session activities. If you haven't, please remember to add Dr. Jennifer Moore's email to your contact list so you get all of the information from this series. Her email is also posted on the slide. We can't thank you enough for coming to participate in the doula and perinatal community health worker learning, learning series from IMI and EMC. We can't wait to see you again in May. Thank you so much.